Hello, everyone, and welcome to Envision's 22nd Design Talk of 2016. We have a really great talk for you today. Jay Malone is here with us to discuss how to prepare for your first design sprint. I'm Margaret Kelsey, and I work on our content and community here at Envision, and I'm going to be taking over our Twitter feed for the next hour or so. As always, you can use hashtag design talks and tweet at me any questions and comments you have. Feel free to tweet out all the awesome things you're learning. I'll have my finger on the retweet button and Jay will be answering your questions at the end of his talk. If you happen to forget that hashtag, it's over on our Twitter at Envision app. If that's not enough motivation, we'll also be giving away a surprise gift to the person with the best tweet. Gifts and gifs, however you say it, are encouraged and I'll contact the winner immediately following the event. We are recording this today. We'll have that recap and a recording up on our blog in just a few days in case you miss any parts of it or want to pass it along to friends and colleagues. I'll be sending you an email with a link to that recap and any other links we discussed today, so keep an eye on your inbox for that. So without further ado, I would like to present to you Jay Malone. Jay, will you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks Margaret. Really excited to be here um, to talk about design sprints, which is obviously a, a pretty new and interesting topic to a lot of folks, especially I'm sure the Envision community. So just start to talk a little bit about who I am. So again, I'm Jay Malone. I'm the CEO at New Haircut. Um, before New Haircut, I had a career which started at Accenture. Um, I was doing a lot of software engineering for them. I spent seven years, which was probably about six years and 10 months too long, but I spent a whole bunch of time at Accenture. Um, that was my first stint building digital projects, products. Um, so when I decided to leave corporate America, I joined a smaller company um, called Part Search Technologies, and it was my first introduction. Uh, one of the things I was charged with over there was helping the company move from this sort of extremely waterfall process of building products, which was kind of indoctrinated into us at Accenture, and move us into this agile way of, of thinking. And that was still new at the time. It was that was back in 2006 or so. So it was new and challenging and trying to think through how to, how to build things faster and more efficiently. Um, I then ventured into my own thing called Fast and Finder. That was an e-commerce marketplace that I built um, back in 2009 or so, which kind of gave me the, the understanding of being a stakeholder, being a, a business owner and managing designers and engineers and trying to get things built and communicate what I was trying to have them build for me and that actually led to the creation of New Haircut, um, which we formed in 2010. <clears throat> so New Haircut, just to give you a little bit of context um, and, and lead it into the topic today of design sprints. So we're a, we're a design and engineering firm. There's 20 of us. Um, we work with clients and stakeholders to build their products. And I think, you know, so we've been at it for about six years or so. And for the first few years, we were building things as the traditional approach, you know, so reviewing spec documents or wireframes or mock-ups that people had been, had been thinking about and, and producing, even reviewing RFPs. And what we saw that it was, it was really challenging because, you know, if you think about it, it's the client or the stakeholder that's been thinking about something for months and years. And then you have this new group of people, us, new haircut, that are trying to understand these ideas and form them into something that even a third group of people, your, the customers or the users of those products are going to use. And it was hard. It was really hard to like, wrap our heads around it. You know, we're expected to put some timelines and budgets to these things. And I'm sure you guys as designers, as maybe product folks, have an understanding of that when you're trying to pitch your proposals and your solutions to the stakeholders. So when we started watching what Google Ventures was doing about a year or so back, really took hold of it. And, uh, you know, they talked about their book coming out. And so we, you know, as the book came out and as we started reading more about their process, we really quickly adopted it and we started using it for some internal products. And we immediately saw the benefit of getting people, bringing customer insight into it from, from the early days. So we were kind of all in, we were sold on it. We more or less transitioned all of our client engagements to start with a design sprint and we really highly encourage it. So that kind of, kind of leads us to where we are today and why we're getting together to talk is hopefully I can share a little bit about the, the 
the process that we've worked through. Um, and hopefully it gives you a foundation. If you're new to sprints, don't worry, we're going to step through this at a, at a really kind of introductory level. Um, if you've been through some sprints, great. Maybe it helps you crystallize some of that process for you. But at the end of today, I'm hoping that it at least, at least gives you the confidence, the foundation to encourage you to run your first sprint. And then, like anything else, you'll get in the room, you'll run one sprint, you'll look back at it, you'll run your second sprint and think, oh my god, how did that first sprint was a disaster, and you'll just keep learning. But hopefully you have enough confidence to move into the sprint. So then let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. What is a design sprint? Um, let's just kind of define it for, for those that are new to it. So the design sprint was coined by the guys um, and gals at Google Ventures. Uh, just a quick backstory on it in case you don't know, in case you haven't read the book. But I recommend you do go read the book. It's available on uh, Amazon and other places. It's called Sprint. It was written by Jake Knapp and John Zeratsky and Braden Kowitz, and I think that's it. Um, but they, I think, with, I believe Jake, who was working inside Google, and he used a similar process to build products like Gmail and Hangouts. And Google, as, a, as an organization, saw the, the benefit of working through that process and the efficiency of it. So they got behind it, and they started using it for other things that they were trying to build. And when Jake moved over to Google Ventures, they continued to refine and refine the process as GV, as, as a venture fund, started using that process to make sure that the companies that they had invested in were thinking about the right things, the right ideas, solving the right problems, right? Because the benefit to them would be if, if they can launch successful companies, they would get the return on their investment. And clearly it worked because they invested in companies like Uber and Slack and I think Blue Bottle Coffee, some of these, you know, companies that clearly had some good success there. Um, so it's this framework and it's really prescriptive. You, you have five days to work through a set of exercises that are all kind of time boxed and done in a certain order. And it's really the first time that, that we're aware of that really loosely coined terms like lean and agile and building lean MVPs and lean startup and all this stuff that sounds great, but you've, but you've never really been, been given this sort of almost like a cookbook for what you should do and how you should bring customer insight into it from the early days. I think a design sprint is the first time that that's been accomplished. Um, so I thought it would also be helpful to talk about some of the conditions when you should run a sprint. And if you're a designer, if you're a product person, you might be getting a little bit of challenge or pushback from your stakeholders. And I get it, I get it as well. So when I'm selling design sprints and product development to the clients that we're working with, a lot of the time they just want to, they, they want to go. You know, what you'll hear them possibly say is like, well, we already did all the research. We already talked to all of our customers. I am the customer. I know what I want to build. Um, we built a demo. That didn't work. Let's just get started. Let's build some things. So they're already giving you the clues that the design sprint is actually going to be the perfect tool for you to, to usher in. So they want to move fast. There's some big challenges ahead of them. They want to make sure that they think about the right things in the right order and get things done quickly. Um, they might also tell you, like, well, how's that going to work? Because I feel one way and Barbara feels another way about what we should build or how we should build it. And again, those are perfect indicators because the sprint is going to level that field, bring in customer insight, and let the group kind of realize together what you should be building and how you should be building it. So these are some great indicators of conditions to run a sprint. Uh, just for context, you can run a sprint for almost anything. So um, if you're building rocket ships, awesome, you can run a sprint for that. Um, if you're writing a book, if you're thinking about launching um, a website, like some kind of marketing website, um, really anything can use the benefit of working through a sprint. For today, we're going to talk about running sprints with digital projects, so building web and mobile applications. right? So there's different stages that you might be at with those projects. Maybe you have a platform, uh, a mobile application, and you know, if, if you're like a lot of companies, you're listening to your customers, you're talking to your customers, you're getting a whole bunch of feature requests or problems or things that they would, they, they love your product, but they wish it would do X, Y, Z. So 
um, if you're, you know, you've picked and prioritized which features you want to launch, and you want to really make sure that you launch them in the way that is going to drive the most success and the most engagement of those features, run a sprint. You might be even earlier than that. You might be at the ideation stage, so you're pre-product. You're just kind of you've been thinking about things, but you haven't actually built a solution. So you want to make sure the entire solution has some merit. And we're going to get into how much of a scope you can bring into a sprint, um, but you can start at the pre-product stage. Alternatively, you might be so maybe you have um, maybe you have a mobile solution today, and you want to bring it to web or vice versa. Maybe you're selling direct to consumers, and you're thinking about launching uh, a version to enterprise. Also, a good opportunity to test with a sprint. Here's a quick kind of, as we're going to get into each day of the sprint, I, I really like this visual to kind of map out that the sprint is five days. You know, there's specific output that comes with each day. And it's five days. It doesn't need to be Monday through Friday. If you're working inside some crazy startup that works seven days a week or even in, you know, a company like Accenture, um, it doesn't matter that it, it's Monday through Friday, just as long as the days are consecutive. You can't break it up at any point and then come back into the sprint and expect to have the same momentum. So make sure that when you run your sprint, it is five consecutive days. I really like this visual because it kind of, it, it lets you see that you come into the sprint and there's sort of this madness. You have people that have been thinking about ideas and products and solutions for weeks, months, sometimes years. Then you bring others into the room that this is a, a new topic for them to be talking about. And you almost feel like you're going backward for, for a minute or two because there's all these ideas being presented. But as you move through the week and you progress through and you start sketching ideas and things become visual and then you're building these prototypes and putting it in front of customers, hopefully the goal by the end of the week is to actually feel really confident about what you validated that you can bring then into your product development sprints. So here's a little bit about the team, um, and if you know this, if you guys are listening, maybe you're the designer in the room, maybe you're the product manager, maybe you're an engineer. Um, but these are sort of the different roles that should be in the room. It's a max of seven. You know, we kind of follow the guidelines that Google Ventures set out, and and we agree it shouldn't be more than seven because then it, it turns into a bit of a mob. Um, but it should probably be more than two or three. You know, I've gotten questions, can I run a sprint by myself? The answer is no, because there's a lot of collaboration that goes on and you need to be able to understand how other people are thinking about things and take that perspective in as you start to frame out your solutions. So but the roles break down by decider, facilitator, and then you have experts that span across marketing and finance and technology and design. But the important thing to know here is that it's that dynamic that, that the different backgrounds that all those people have. You know, think about how a designer interacts with a customer and the market, what they know about the market versus maybe the decider or the stakeholder that's been living that those problems and that pain for months and years. So bringing all those different disciplines and backgrounds and exposure into the same room, that's really the power of the sprint. And we'll get into how it's much different to do it like this than to just get everybody together and do some kind of like big group thinking brainstorming session. So last thing in terms of logistics that you'll want to know as you gear up for your design sprint, your first design sprint, a few simple rules. Um, make sure the facilitator, what, he's, what he or she is telling you is, is being followed. The facilitator is going to be, you know, hopefully that's the most seasoned person with design sprints that's in the room with you guys. Um, they've been through one or more sprints. They understand how aggressive the timelines are, what you need to be doing in this minute versus in 20 minutes from now. They know the, the challenges that are coming up. They know how to you know, make sure that everybody's working within the roles that you've decided, which we just talked about. Uh, rule number two, there's a decider, and you'll pick that decider on Monday. And everyone is going to have a chance to voice their ideas and do their own solutions and vote on what they feel is the best solution. But at the end of the day, the decider is the person that makes the tough call to say, we're going in this direction. So they have the ultimate, the, the ultimate say. Uh, and lastly, no devices in the room. There's just no time. 
to be checking email and spazzing out on the internet. It's just it's just way too much momentum and collaboration that needs to keep keep moving forward. Okay, I thought it'd be good a good idea to use a, a product that we worked through a design sprint to give you some context in terms of a real life experience of New Haircut working through a design sprint and how we thought about things and, and just use that as our sort of leading example. So it's a product called Gifty. Uh, it's, it's being developed now. It went through a design sprint and the challenge that we entered the room with on Monday was the, the experience of buying gifts for friends and family sucks. I don't think many people love doing it and there probably are some people out there that enjoy going to the mall on like Christmas Eve and being insane, but I personally do not. So we created Gifty for that exact challenge. Um, and there were a few leading criteria that we thought this is, there, there's an opportunity here, there's something to solve here. Um, and those are, you know, everybody buys gifts for friends and family, um, I think, I hope. Uh, we've all probably forgotten at least one gift. I definitely have multiple times. Uh, buying gifts is time consuming. So whether you're doing it online or going to the mall or wherever you're, wherever you're shopping, it's still going to take a whole bunch of time. Um, and then just getting the right gift is hard. Even if you spend hours looking for the best gift for your mother-in-law, she may just turn around and be like, this is stupid. Right. And then you've kind of wasted all your time. So how do we improve that whole process? And that was the challenge that we set out to solve with Gifty. Okay, so now we're going to get into each day of the week. Um, Monday. Monday is, is important. Every day is important, but the reason that Monday is important is because this is your foundational day for the rest of the week. You're going to enter the room. Um, you may be, This may be a completely new idea to you, so you're hearing about this idea potentially for the first time. If you are the stakeholder, you'd be sharing it with strangers maybe for the first time. So you need to get acclimated. Everybody needs to be on this on level ground. Like what is the vision? What's, what, what are you talking about here? What have you done so far? What have you learned about the problem? Have you built a demo? How did that go? You know, you can spend some time looking at metrics if you had them to see what worked and what didn't work. Um, maybe you did some customer interviews, so taking a look at those things. So again, the, the start the day on Monday by just everybody kind of introducing themselves, talk about the problem, talk about why you're in the room together. And once you get there, the first real exercise that you'll do on Monday is to set your long-term goal. So this is the chance for the stakeholders to say and announce really where they want to be in 6 to 12 months from now. Um, you want to like, you want to encourage them to remove, don't think about boundaries, right? So think in a perfect state, where do you want to be as a company, as a team in those six to 12 months? Um, this is their chance to, to set that vision and, and get you sort of excited about where things want to go from here. So as an example for Gifty, the long-term goal that we set was help people buy the perfect gift for every occasion, right? And you can you can see the limitlessness in there, right? A perfect gift for every single occasion, for every time you buy a gift. That seems pretty lofty, but that's where we wanted to go. So we didn't want to like set the bar too low. We wanted to say like, let's let's make sure that this thing allows us to buy the perfect gift every time for every event. Once you have your goal, then, you know, probably as you're talking about that goal and you're realizing the audacity of it or the vision of it or how much it needs to be true for that to become the goal that you hit, you'll start to think about all these questions and problems and challenges that you may hit along the way. And it's good to go get those out on the table as a team. You know, so then everybody, there's no bias or fear or pessimism in terms of what can be accomplished because all those questions are, have been queued up. Um, the type of questions that you'd ask are what has to be true to hit our goal, um, what would both success and failure look like. So this is important. I want to talk about this for one second. So um, everybody's going to be real excited as the week goes on. You're going to be doing things and creating things and momentum and everyone's going to get really excited, I hope. Um, but there needs to be a fallback in case you come out of the sprint and everything gets invalidated. There needs to be a plan B. You can't just hit a dead end and that's the end of it. So talk about what it would look like to also have 
to also hit a, a bit of a roadblock on Friday if you hear back from your customers that they're not appreciating what you've built. And then maybe the marketers in the room are the ones that are going to want to hear about how do we measure this thing? How do we make sure that it was validated, but once we bring our product to market, that we can measure that it's successful? So this is where you'll start maybe mentioning KPIs or key performance indicators. So again, let's bring it back to Gifty to give you guys some examples. Uh, these are some of the questions that, the actual questions that we called out as we were thinking about Gifty. So will the app recommend suitable gifts? Will we get good deals from it? Will people be willing to share their trusted information? Will users trust the app? And will searching for gifts or getting gift recommendations be easy enough? So these questions, again, they kind of, they set the, the tone for what are the challenges that need to be answered by the end of the sprint. Once you have those questions, so, so now let's think about it. Let's just rewind for one second. So you, everybody knows what, where we're headed as, in, in terms of vision. They know they're, they're on equal footing. You have your long-term goal. You have your questions, your sprint questions. Now it's time to start to visualize for the first time what that customer experience might look like. And this is a simple exercise, and simple is important here because there's definitely a tendency, and we've we've faulted here as well. There's a tendency to, to go too far down in terms of mapping this out. Keep it simple, keep it five to 15 steps. You can see um, here's the map that we created for Gifty. So it shows, you know, these are, this is as simple as it gets. A customer or someone that's buying gifts for friends and family, what they need to do to get from thinking about they need to buy a gift for their mother-in-law to the point where they actually buy the gift. So we thought that the simplest series of events were that they would have some profile of, the, of that friend or family member that they want to buy gifts for, which events they buy those gifts for, and then getting recommendations of which gifts to buy and, and ultimately buying that gift. So this is, this is a map. This is the biggest end deliverable of Monday. And again, you can see the goal is kept up at the top, and that's important because the map needs to solve for that goal. Remember, it's helping people buy the perfect gift for every occasion. So and these are the, this is the steps that we'll take to get through that. Okay, so you have your map, right? And now, the, for the first time, you're going to bring outsiders into this discussion. So experts are just people that have experience of, of dealing with that map that you just drew up. And you're going, to put, you're going to bring them into the room, and you're going to explain to them what you're trying to solve for. You're going to put that map in front of them. And you're going to ask them to just kind of talk about how their experience. Um, did you get the map right? Is, is there something you're missing or not thinking about? And what's going to happen is as they're talking about their experience and what they're seeing you're trying to do to solve for it, they're going to be calling out ideas and challenges or questions that you need to start capturing because those are your opportunities that you're going to be solving for. And you'll, you'll capture those in the form of these how might we's, how might we's, I, I think this came out of uh, the design group IDEO. And it really, it's just a format for capturing ideas that makes it a little bit open-ended and encouraging. So it starts with how might we, and then you kind of list out um, the solution. So like, for example, one of the customers we spoke to at, at Gifty was questioning, how is this thing going to re make recommendations that are really appropriate for my mother-in-law, for example? So you turn that into a how might we, how might we, how might the applicate, how might Gifty make recommended, um, make appropriate recommendations for friends and family, right? And what happens is now that you've listed all, you, you have your goal, your questions, you have your map, you've listened to experts, you've captured how might we's, all this you start to realize. Um, your place on the map that's going to present the biggest opportunity to solve for, but also the biggest challenge. So what we did is when we looked at Gifty, we thought, you know, if Gifty can help you create really accurate profiles of your friends and family, so knowing what your mother-in-law likes, I don't know, where she shops, um, what color she likes, uh, when her birthday is, just different things like that, the more um, targeted that profile is, the rest of the experience will follow and, and will hopefully get you to the point of buying a really a, a gift that will earn you some, some credit with mom and mom. So what, that hap what happens is you see that that part is circled on the map here and that becomes your target. And it doesn't mean that 
your prototype is going to gloss over the rest of the experience, and we'll get into what that looks like when we get into storyboarding and the prototype. But it's just that you're going to focus specifically on solving this part of the map. This is your target. This is your biggest opportunity to create a solution for. So this becomes your target for the, for the rest of the week. And that's why this becomes, so that, that's the end of Monday. That's why this whole, the, the day was spent kind of getting you to this point to figure out what's your goal, um, what questions do we need to answer by the end of the sprint, what does that journey look like, and where are we going to focus for the week in terms of our solutions that we create. So when you get into the room on Tuesday, um, you are going to, and I just realized, I don't think I mentioned, um, we run our sprints from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It typically works well because you get people at the beginning of the day and the end of the day to do all their email madness and meetings and all that other stuff. So when you walk into the room Tuesday, 10 o'clock in the morning with your sprint team, you're going to, this is, today becomes an important day because now finally you're starting to get creative. So you're starting to put pen to paper and think about actual solutions. And these solutions are going to be visual, which is also important because everybody can understand a visual solution as opposed to like, you know, a written document that, that can be inferred in, in a number of different ways. Everything that we're doing today is very visual. And you'll start with an exercise called Lightning Demos. Uh, Lightning Demos gives you a chance to get some outside inspiration. So look at competing products, look at things that have been created or thought about or talked about even outside of your industry. Spend you know, 20 minutes or so um, to get to pull in all that outside information and then each person will, will have a chance to talk about what they found and somebody else is at the board capturing that information and those ideas and maybe some doodles and just things. And what's important is you have everything that you created on Monday and now you're starting to have more artifacts that are starting to fill the room and those are going to be important to take you into the next set of exercises that you'll do with your team. So it's this kind of four-step sketching exercise. And it's four steps because it takes you from, you know, you, got, you might be a designer, but I'm not a designer. I'm, I'm like a sales guy, right? So I write long documents and bore everybody to death with decks and things like this. Whereas when you start thinking about solutions, you might jump right into visually what, is, what does an interface look like? What, how are we going to solve for this? What's the experience look like? But for me, that's troubling. So I'll tend to write my ideas down with words. So it's going to encourage me. This process is going to encourage somebody like myself to move from words and just rough ideas into actual sketches and solutions. Um, and that's important because that will seed your storyboard and your prototype in, in the following days. So what you're going to do is you're gonna, everybody's going to have a chance to now walk around the room silently, individually, but still as a team, and look at everything on the room, start to take notes, migrate those notes into more refined notes, and maybe some doodles, maybe some, some light sketching, just to kind of prime you, because that information is going to seed the next set of exercises. So those are crazy eights and solution sketches. So let's look at what those accomplish. So you're taking your notes, you've got, you've, you refine them a bit, you maybe have some doodles in front of you. Now you're going to take your most important, your most, the ideas that you're most excited about, and you're going to do this crazy eight exercise. You take a piece of paper, you know, letter size paper, um, or A4, depending on where you are in the world, and you fold it in three. So now you have eight panels on your piece of paper, and you're now given a chance to write up eight varying solutions to solve for that target on your map. So if you remember Gifty, the target there was to create a profile of your friends and family. So what you would be doing if you were in the room with us for the Gifty's design sprint is we'd say, okay, go in and sketch up eight solutions for what that profile would look like of your friends and family. Right? And you have eight minutes, so it's about one minute per box. This is probably the most um, time boxed event that you'll do during the week. And it's challenging, but again, it's to get you primed, and you're going to take the momentum from that exercise and bring it into your solution sketch. So think about your solution sketch being an even more refined version um, that even shows flow within the creation of that, again, using Gifty, the, the creation of that profile of your friend or family member. So some people, when they do this exercise, will show 
what happens right before you get to that target on your map and what happens after. Some people will show three scenes within that actual um, target that you're solving for. So just to give it some context, and then I'll go back to this. For Gifty, you can see the one on the right here. So the, this sketch, this solution sketch, somebody drew the actual login screen and what they click login and then they kind of eventually land on the user profile screen. And that's one way to do it. And sometimes you'll have three panels, sometimes you'll have six panels, depends how much you're trying to communicate, how complex is the solution that you're trying to, to work up. Um, but to go back to it, the important things to know when you go into your solution sketch are four things. One, make sure it's really self-explanatory. So use words, language is important, right? Use words that make sense, don't, draw, don't just draw squiggly lines or write lorem ipsum or anything like this. It needs to stand on its own because tomorrow there's going to be an opportunity for everybody to look at all the solution sketches and try to understand them and, and pick the winning one and we'll get into that. So make it stand on its own, keep it anonymous, that way there's no bias about who did what. Um, especially, you know, again, think about you as a designer versus, I don't know, the legal guy in the room or the salesperson in the room. They're going to be intimidated out of the gate, so keep it anonymous, that way nobody's judging the work of anybody else. But give it a catchy title, that way everybody can, you know, kind of know that the work is their own. And again, if you're the designer in the room, encourage people to be like, don't, don't worry that, this, that it's ugly or whatnot. Just try to communicate the solution. So it doesn't matter if it's pretty. Um, okay, so this is, again, this is an example of one of the solution sketches that came out of Gifty. And then here's another from a different sprint that we ran. Uh, just to show that you can go into significant detail if time allows, I think. Depending on how you're doing on timing, you can spend anywhere from 20 minutes to a couple hours on these things. Uh, so for this one, there was a lot to kind of infer about the solution. And you can see that this person drew up pretty detailed, a pretty detailed interface, and then they drew arrows to show you know, the flow as you click on this button, I move to this next step in the process. Uh, the one last thing I wanted to talk about before we move into Wednesday is that, as you can see, there's there's artifacts and there's solutions and there's all this stuff being done by seven people or so. And that's really powerful. Uh, it's, not, it's not your typical brainstorming where the highest paid person in the room or the person with the biggest title is doing all the talking, getting all the attention for the idea that they want to see the light of day and everybody else is kind of just nodding their heads but thinking other stuff. Because you're taking all the work of everybody and putting it up for everyone to see but then work through themselves, and then come back and collaborate on, it lets everybody have, let their ideas kind of flourish a bit. Much more powerful than, bra than brainstorming. Um, and honestly, what we've seen and what I've heard from others on the team is that a lot of the time it's the most, it's the quietest people in the room that have the best ideas. Okay, so when you come into the room on Wednesday, you've got all your solution sketches up and all the other stuff that you've put together. And now it's your time to Everybody's going to have a chance to walk around the room again silently. You're going to everybody's been, going to be given uh, these small dot stickers, and you'll have stickies and, and, and pencils and pens. And you'll walk around the room. Um, you'll capture notes, and what you'll be doing is uh, putting stickers next to things that you like that inspire you. And um, the decider actually has a larger sticker. So what happens is by the end of this exercise, you step back and you start to see a pattern of what everybody in the room thought was the best solutions. And now it's the decider's job to say whether they want to go in that direction and agree with the team, which more often than not is, is the case and, and how things play out, but they can decide to go in a different direction. right? Um, but what's cool is that you're using the power of the team to show which solutions should get turned into your storyboard. And um, what happens, just so you guys have some a frame of reference, one solution may be the winning solution that gets storyboarded. Uh, you may have parts of different solutions that turn into one storyboard. You may decide to create multiple storyboards if you can't decide and you want to kind of go head to head to see which storyboard is the one you want to move forward with. 
So you've picked your winners, and now it's time to create that storyboard or multiple storyboards. Um, think of a storyboard like a comic book, right? It takes you as and your actors or your customers from start to finish through the sequence of events. So your solution sketch focused on that specific target. Your storyboard is that entire experience. And that's important because on Thursday, when you build that prototype, you want the customers that you, that you interview to have that entire experience. That way you'll get more out, they'll feel more immersed in the experience of what an actual customer would be engaged with. So it, it could even be showing them um, an email that they've been invited to, to Gifty. It could be that they're searching in the App Store and they find Gifty, installing it on their phones, right? So as much as you can mock up for them to make them feel and live that experience, great. Um, make sure, the important thing is by the end of Wednesday, your storyboard needs to be as complete as possible. So fill in all the missing details, add in all the missing pieces before and after that solution sketch that you focused on on Tuesday. Um, but it needs to be complete because on Thursday, that storyboard is what you're going to prototype. And there's not going to be any time to go back and refine and fill in missing, missing pieces then. So make sure it's, it's really wrapped up. And that takes us into, oh, here's an example of a storyboard that we created, just so you can get a sense. This was drawn up on a whiteboard. And so again, that leads us into Thursday, which is prototyping day. Um, Thursday is the culmination of all the work that you've done so far in terms of creating your solution. So it's exciting, but there's really a lot of work to get done because your prototype needs to be as realistic as possible, like we talked about. And in order to do that within one day's time, and I get this question a lot, how can you possibly create one, a prototype in one day? And it is possible because you're focused on this really specific challenge and you're kind of making it as realistic and mocked up as you can and then getting as much information as you can about that target. But the other things that you can do, there's, there's, there's two tools that you can use at your disposal. One is that you're going to use the tools or software that everybody on the team is as familiar with as possible. Um, if you're a heavy design group and you feel like you can use Sketch, great, use Sketch. Just make sure that you don't that's a slippery slope and you start over designing it and you just don't have time to, to go down that path. And if you think you're going to go down that path, then go simple. Go use tools like Keynote and PowerPoint. They work just as well. You'd be surprised how much you can mock up inside those tools. And then I know this is an Envision design talk, but we've been a customer of theirs for years now. And we really like the power of Envision for actually creating the working prototype. So it gives you those clicks and taps and, and, and that transition so that people feel like they're using your product. The other thing that you're going to do to make sure that you can get through the end of the day and have your prototype is you're going to divide and conquer. So there's different roles that you want to give to the people to help on the team to build that prototype. Let's just step through those quickly. So one is an asset collector. So that person is going out and collecting your content. This audio, video that could be part of the application. Right? And they're seeding that to the builder, who's actually giving form of those assets to what will become the prototype. Again, using Keynote or Sketch or PowerPoint or whatnot. The wordsmith is working with the builder to make sure that within those, those prototypes, language is accurate and will incentivize users and help them get through that experience. And then they're feeding all of those assets to the stitcher, who's using tools, again, like, like Envision, to give it to bring it to life, to make it this realistic func uh, functional prototype. The interviewer is the person that's looking at the storyboard, looking at the prototype, and making sure their script is ready so that they can step the, the, the customers on Friday through that prototype. Now, um, here's the thing. You're supposed to wrap up your prototype by like 3 in the afternoon. Um, that has never happened for us. And if it doesn't happen for you, don't freak out. So if you're going until 9 o'clock at night because you really want to, like, your solution needs to be really fulfilled, then go to 9 o'clock at night. Just make sure you give yourself two to three hours or so so that you can demo it as a team and, you know, maybe you missed something or screwed something up, but make sure before you leave for the day you have your, your prototype all ready and wrapped up because when you enter the room on Friday, your first customer will be there waiting for you to look at your prototype so you don't want to have to be scrambling first thing Friday morning. So that brings us to Friday. So Friday is really exciting. 
um, and you should be excited about it because now you've spent all this time and you've gotten you've 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 accomplished more likely than you have in any other project outside of a design sprint in these five in these four days than you have in weeks and months. Uh, at least that's what we've experienced. So you've spent all this time as a team. You've gone from just a basic idea that needs to be solved to an actual working prototype. That's so you should feel really excited about that. You should feel proud about that. Um, for most of the team, they can kind of relax and kick back a little bit. The interviewer has a little bit more stress for today because they just have to make sure the customers they're talking to understand the prototype and get them talking about it. And the way that it works is you have you have the customer interviewer that you picked out um, and they're going to be one and one and one with your customers in a room. The rest of the team is in a separate room watching the live stream and the only thing that they need to be doing is capturing ideas and reactions that the customers are calling out. And what that looks like is of course stickies, right? So you have a marker and you have stickies and, you're, and each person is capturing a note or an idea and you're you put, the, you put it on this grid that you have here. So in the columns, you have your customers that you spoke to. In your rows, you have the features and the screens or the, or the steps in your map. And as customers are talking about that experience, you're capturing that stuff. And what happens is this is the culmination of everything. So if you're getting a lot of smiles and head nods and this is great and, and I would use this and all that stuff, you're getting the validation that you hoped you would have gotten. Right? So let's talk about the possible outcomes that can happen at this stage. So again, continuing on that path, and this is what happened with Gifty, so we can use that as, as our example. When we showed this to Gifty, they were excited about it. They said, oh my god, if this thing actually does what it, it says it's going to do, and it saves me all this time, and I start buying gifts that make sense, and I stop forgetting about anniversaries and all this stuff, I would totally use this thing. So that's 100% to that's validation, and you should feel really excited because now you can move into your, you know, your product sprints. So your typical stuff, you, you can start getting into deeper wireframes. Um, at New Haircut, we have a proprietary process that follows design sprints called a code sprint. It's kind of the technology version of the design sprint where we bring engineers into the room to vet and make sure that te technology, from a technology perspective, what we intend to build can be built. And we have that foundational level layer of the application. And then you know your 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 agile product sprints that follow until you launch to market. So that's yay, celebrate, everybody go get drunk. You've you validated and now you're ready to, to start building your product. Um, step down from that, you can partially validate, maybe half partial you've half validated your product. Maybe along the way customers were getting hung up on certain pieces or they were like, mm, I really like this, but this I don't care about, this I'll never do. Right, so then maybe you need to go back and just run a sprint. You don't need to really start it Monday or Tuesday, but maybe you, you rethink your storyboard and rebuild your prototype and retest one more time and fill in the missing pieces. And then hopefully at that point, you can move into product development. Worst case scenario, you completely invalidate. Now, so silver lining, you've invalidated in five days, right? And that should be something that you communicate to your stakeholders that are pushing back on you um, potentially today and saying, why do we need to do this? Because in five days, imagine invalidating five days versus five months versus five years and all the money that's associated with all that time that's spent on that. And this is where, to go back to where we started this talk, having that plan B is really, really important. So that is the sprint. Um, now, like I'm like I want, well, I wanted to talk about one other thing that hopefully will be helpful to you guys. Uh, we created Duco. Duco what came out of New Haircuts Labs, and we built it for our own for our own good at first to really kind of cement and crystallize the process of design sprints. Um, it kind of breaks down and goes into more detail about how each day should be spent. There's videos in there that you can watch to give you an overview of each day. There's materials to help you make sure you're prepared for each day. Um, it's available on iOS right now. And you know, just so you know, and maybe what you would do as a designer, maybe if you're trying to communicate the value of sprints, maybe you download this thing and you encourage the stakeholders to download this thing and then you give it, you, you walk through it with them. Um, and say like, you know, this is going to be the tool that we use to, to guide us through the sprint. Um, 
but I think it's going to be helpful. We give it to clients that are that we're about to start engagements with because they ask a lot of questions about how should we prepare for the sprint. So we, you know, aside from all the discussions that we have and how we gear them up for the sprint, we also encourage them to go download this app. So it's duco.newhaircut.com. Feel free to download it. It's the first time we're introducing it to anybody. So um, if there's bugs or if there's anything quirky in there, feel free to, to shoot us an email and we're going to be actively iterating on this thing and hopefully we'll have an Android version soon. Last thing I wanted to talk to you about before Q&A is if anyone on the call is in Berlin or in, in the area in Europe, um, my partner and some of the team at New Haircut are going to be running a design sprint workshop, an interactive workshop in Berlin on November 3rd to 4th. So if anyone's available, sign up. You can sign up at workshop.newhaircut.com. We hope to see you there. So now just some Q&A. Awesome. We already have some really great, great questions, Jay. Um, in just a moment, I'll start asking those to you. Um, for those of you who haven't asked your question yet, feel free to use Twitter with hashtag design talks um, and also use the GoToWebinar question portal if you prefer. So while we wait for some additional questions to come in, I just wanted to do a quick poll. And um, we would love to give a free trial of Envision's enterprise platform for those of you who are collaborating with six or more people in your design process. So if that sounds like you, go ahead and indicate so on the screen. If you're interested, I'm not going to go through all of the features right now, um, but we'll have somebody contact you and, and get you set up for an enterprise trial. Um, Jay, I'm going to keep that poll up for just a few minutes while we begin those questions, if that sounds good to you. Sure. Awesome. So the first question is from Laura, and actually I saw a few other people asking this later on, but Laura was the first, and she said, can you talk a little bit more about selling the concept of a sprint to a client, especially when they think that they've already done the research or that they are the user? Right, and this is, this is definitely one of the things, and especially since sprints are so new to even, even a group like ourselves, like designers and, and product people, um, maybe you don't have all the, the proof or the case studies or, or what you're trying to do to, to demonstrate a sprint. So I think what, what's been successful for me is to, um, to take them through examples of or maybe sh compare it to what would happen. So kind of like what exists today, right? And what, what I've, what's worked is to explain to people today you have a process of working through requirements gathering and all of these things that you do to get you to the point where you might be ready to build something. And again, you still, maybe there's some customer research in there, maybe there's some user testing, but there's no way that it's done inside those five days. Um, and there's really no proof or a hard process that takes you from start to finish there. So I think encouraging the fact that it's five days, that's, that's been really powerful for me to, sh to talk about five days and to show exactly what you're going to get at the end of that, to have those hard deliverables and to be able to explain that there's a process to talk about how Google Ventures has used this same process to launch really, really successful companies also is a, a good stake of validation. Um, and then, you know, I think getting them over that hurdle um, of being in the room that first day, you know, maybe encourage them to get in the room that first day. I promise you that once you spend that one day together, it's really going to kind of open up the discussion. Um, if, it, if it helps, so far all of the design sprints that we've run at New Haircut have turned into product development um, projects that we've helped out companies with. So it's, a, it's been 100% effective for getting teams and companies to that next stage of building product. 100% of the time it works every time, right? Yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, Shelby asked, what is the smallest sprint team size that you could potentially have and is bigger is a bigger team always better? So I still think that, so to answer the second part first, I still think that um, seven, maybe eight people is should be your max just because then it gets a little bit too unruly. Um, even in the workshops that we've done, um, we try to encourage that the participants are, the head count is less than 20 or so, just because as you're working through exercises, you really want to kind of focus in. A lot of these things are new to people, so the facilitator's job becomes a little challenging if they're spending all of their time encouraging 10, 15 people in terms of what they should be doing. So I think seven or eight is just a good rule of thumb. Um, 
and keep in mind, Google Ventures has refined this over time and they work through you doing sprints in a month, in um, two days, in two weeks. So we didn't invent this thing. We're kind of, we're piggybacking off all the research and all the trials that they've worked through. So we follow their rule and so far seven or eight has worked. I think the smallest team, um, I don't think we've ever run a sprint with less than four people because you do want to have a couple disciplines in the room. You, you know, it's important that your facilitator can just facilitate. If your facilitator is also owning language and playing designer, then they're not really helping to facilitate. So I think four might be the minimum. You want to make sure that you have coverage, I would say, from a facilitator standpoint, somebody that can help through design, somebody that can own language. Those are probably the top three. And of course, your decider. Um, who can, who, you know, so it's important that you have really diversified roles. So let's just say that I would, I would recommend that four is probably the least amount. Hmm. Awesome. Um, Claire asked, uh, do you have any practical tips for running a design sprint when there are several remote team members? Good question. Uh, we've been asked a number of times, um, can we run a sprint virtually for a couple reasons. One is that like you just mentioned, there could be teams that are virtual that need to be part of it, part of the discussion. Um, sometimes it's hard logistically to get everybody in the same room. Even for us as a company, sometimes we might be running a sprint. You know, we're based out of New Jersey and Romania, and sometimes it's hard for us to run a sprint in California, or we just ran one in Berlin. We're doing, you know, so sometimes it's hard to get those groups together. Um, so far, we've pushed back and said that this really needs to be done, everybody in the same room. Um, where we found Slack is that it doesn't necessarily need to be all seven people for all five days. There are opportuni opportunities for people to dip in and out, minus that core group of, of three or four people. Um, but I think having people virtually dial in and listen and participate even over web chat there's just so much that's happening in the room and so much that's around the room that even if your camera is on everybody, just you're looking at the room, you're looking at goals and questions and, and sketches and all these things and it's constantly inspiring you and seeding your ideas that to have people outside of the room trying to participate is going to be really challenging. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so Frank asked, can you reflect on your experience with past design sprints and give us an example of a design sprint gone wrong, if you have one, and what happened and how have you avoided that occurrence in future sprints? Okay, so um, good question. We just ran a sprint in Berlin. So when we entered the sprint, the, the stakeholders had an idea for, for a product. And at the end of, I wasn't in the sprint, so I'm, 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 I'm telling you what I know from what I've heard from the team. I think by the end of day one, um, it became clear that this was not something that was going to be validated. Even the stakeholders themselves helped to invalidate the, the idea before it even had a chance to move into, into day number two. So the sprint itself isn't designed to come up with challenges or ideas. That's not the intention of the sprint. The intention of the sprint is to work through that challenge and come up with solutions and prototypes that you can put in front of your customers. So we weren't prepared for this, but what we did was we, it turned out that one of the founders on the team had a related idea and we worked through that idea and we basically started over. We, we felt there was merit to it on the end of day two, which should have been solution day but it turned into that day number two went back to being day number one and we worked through that day and at the end of the day we had a map and we had a good feeling that this also had merit and, and would warrant a sprint and everybody in the room was excited about it and we even, I think, you know, we, then we brought in some experts on day number two um, and they kind of validated a lot of what we were thinking about. So it didn't follow the exact prescriptive five-day process and it kind of went outside of the boundaries of a sprint but we were able to use, you know, kind of the, like a bit of the framework and just extend it a bit so that we could still get through the sprint. And now we're, the sprint actually ended successfully and we validated this new idea and now we're in the midst of, of putting together a roadmap and thinking through the development of this product. Awesome. Um, 
Caitlin asked kind of an interpersonal question. She said, how can teams make sure that the facilitator and the decider don't cross into that line of micromanaging? Well, um, let's talk, let's take the decider first. So the decider, uh, you know what becomes clear is everybody's opinion is up on the wall in the form of sketches that they've created and then the stickers in terms of what, what everybody feels has been is the, is the best approach. So when the decider goes against the grain there, it's, it's really obvious. Um, but so that's one thing. The other thing is that a lot of these exercises are done individually. So there's no opportunity for the decider who might be your CEO or, or the founder of the company to come in and say like, why are you doing this? I, I want it this way, right? Everybody's doing individual stuff. And that avoids that kind of brainstorming and persuasion that might happen. Uh, the facilitator, you know, they're not really making, I think if anybody were going to influence, it would be the decider. The facilitator's role really is to just keep the sprint on track and, on pro and, and doing the right exercises and that everybody is in the right role. So they may, the only thing that, the only danger there is um, if people are straying into different roles. I think if anything, the facilitator should be shepherding to make sure that you're sticking to your role, but not necessarily driving and micromanaging what you're doing inside of that role. I hope that's helpful. Awesome, yeah. Um, so we had a couple questions about mapping. Um, Virginia asked, how do you convince people to keep it simple while mapping? And also, how do you facilitate that pragmatism in practice? Yeah, and, and uh, so we failed here. Uh, the first couple sprints we did were uh, we even had pictures of it for a while. There were you would see this map, and it had like 20 steps on it, and there were sub steps coming off of the main steps. And I think it becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly because what's supposed to be—I forget how long you spent on on the map itself—but what's supposed to be, say, a 20-minute exercise or so it turns into this hour-long exercise. So right away, the facilitator is going to raise their hand and say, "This is going too far." And again, that's why the facilitator is there because they've been through a sprint and they know how far you should take some discussions and they know what's coming afterward and that's also powerful. They know that you're going to get into the detail and the minutia of all the things that the map will be extended to, to, to address and talk about. So that's their role to make sure that you're not going too deep. Awesome. And um, I don't remember who asked this, but I have it on my list of questions. Um, so someone said, how do you decide which segment of the map you want to work on during the sprint? Good question. Um, so that comes by during, at, at, while you're working through Monday, you've got your goal, you've got your sprint questions, you've got your, you know, sort of the influence of the how might we's from the experts. And what, what you look at is this is also, you can kind of form a pattern to see where are the biggest opportunities to solve for during this thing and what's going to be the, the hardest challenge that's on that map. So you want to take your biggest challenge in the sprint. If you're there and you're going to crank through five days, you want to make sure that you're solving the hardest piece of the puzzle in there. And what you hear from the team as they're asking these questions and the experts as, as they're talking out loud are many people are talking about the same thing that's going to be the biggest challenge. And once you hear that repeatedly, repeatedly, and you have stickies and you have things that show that that thing has been mentioned multiple times, that becomes your target. That becomes where you want to key in on. Oh, fantastic. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, Jennifer asked, uh, how do you recommend sprints for existing projects that need an overhaul of redesign? Do you start at the beginning and treat it like a brand new project? If so, how do you not fall into the trap of keeping things the same? So I would say yes, you'd still run through the entire process of the sprint itself. Um, you may have more information that's available at your fingertips, and that's great. You know, some companies or some teams will be starting really kind of at ground zero with, with just a challenge that they feel is worth solving. Others have built products that failed but feel like there's still life. There's there. Um, there may be surveys, there may be customer research that you've done. So if you, you're in the midst of a project and you're stuck, right, that was one of the criteria for when you should run a sprint, so that's, a, it's, that's why it's a great question. You still, it still has merit that you can start at the beginning, 
just where you are is a different starting point than where some other teams may, may begin from, but you still get in a room and you still get everybody on the same page in terms of what the goal is and what you're trying to solve for, why you're stuck, talk about all that stuff, but then run it through the sprint and you're still going to receive you know, the same kind of validation, the same kind of reward from, from working it through that five-day process. Perfect. And I think we have time for one more question. Jordan asked, how would you use a sprint for really large projects, say building a SaaS platform? Do you create an MVP or do you break it into features and do a sprint per feature? This is, this is a, a very popular question, so I'm glad somebody asked it. Um, we've run sprints on entire solutions. And you really, you know, so again, the facilitator and their experience there is helpful. Having others that have been through a sprint are helpful because you know what you can accomplish by the end of the week, but you still need to get it. You still need to refine it to that, to that map and to that simple, you know, walkthrough of the experience and picking that specific target on the map. So, you know, if you think about building, um, Uber didn't run a sprint on building Uber. Uber probably ran a sprint on how can we get somebody from A to, from a to Z using you know, a, a passenger car. Then they, you know, they ran a sprint later to, do, to think about Uber pool or what would it look like to build this experience outside of iOS and inside Android. So they, they might have had a big goal in mind, but once you walk into the room, you have to have a very specific challenge that you want to solve for during the week. So a challenge is not build a SaaS platform. And I get why it, be, would be, it would be tempting, especially for stakeholders that might be pushing back and saying, if we're going to do this thing, we've got to solve the whole thing all at once. It's just not practical. You, it still is only one week, and you still will get a ton accomplished. But you can't solve an entire, um, you can't create an entire solution inside that one week. There's just not enough time. But there is the opportunity to prioritize your challenges of that solution and come out of it, get validation on that one piece, right? Don't solve the whole thing. Solve one of the biggest, most challenging pieces, feel good about that, and then run a sprint on the next thing. You know, you can run multiple sprints time and again, and you can be running that sprint while your product development is happening in parallel. So things, you know, again, so it doesn't need to be the whole thing, think as small as you can and build that momentum. Fantastic. And so we had so many more questions and great questions that we didn't have time to ask. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Jay, so much for chatting with us and sharing your knowledge. And also a big thanks to everyone who attended today. I hope you have a great rest of your day and keep making awesome things. Thanks.